be voting in favour of this budget tonight. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Cameron. Thank you. Sorry, I, I won't uh, stand. Sorry. Um, you know, the litany, uh, litany of errors you've heard, the litany of errors you've heard over the decade, um, they do all predate the current chief exec and many of the senior leadership team. I have confidence in their ability to shape the future of the world, which is why I have to support the decision tonight, but I also support the decision to seek exceptional financial support. When elected members choose not to even sign a letter, it shows their lack of grasp of the reality of the situation. And then when they pretend they're living in an ulterior universe and they don't have to um, comply with SIP for recommendations, I think, what planet are you on? I supported that decision, I will support the decision tonight, as painful as it is. The Lib Dems have mentioned a three million contingency and it shouldn't be blown, I tend to agree. Other members questioned the 15% level. Well, if you look at the couple of years just prior to the pandemic, let's not go back 10 years, let's just take the budget setting just before the pandemic, 2018-19, if we exclude adults and children's services, the Labour cabinet set a budget of 104 million. They spent 127.7 million. That's what was spent, nowhere near the budget. In 2019-20, just before the pandemic, the budget was set at 101 million, but they spent 109 million. So when I talk at committee of these problems being baked in, when I talk of the difficulties we have in addressing the structural deficit, it's because you've got 31.9 million in just the two years prior to the pandemic that you've busted through the budget, excluding adults and children's. In some respects, it's a good job the COVID money came in because we've seen it help in lots and lots of ways. Going forward, I have faith in officers who work hard to meet the budget envelope. We're setting the budget envelope today and then they will make operational decisions. Those operational decisions that the Lib Dems refer to, they don't seem to want to take part in the committee system as one of the parties who welcomed the change in governance to a committee system. Why are they choosing last minute amendments and also trying to undermine the committee system? Because we know next year the hard work starts. I didn't think some parties wanted handouts from Whitehall. Um, all they quote is a reduction in the central grant from government. The topic never comes up about the devolution deal. On Wirral, we're part of 100% business rates retention, and you can see that in your pack on page 347.12.7. The Wirral is £7 million better off, £7 million better off from being in the business rates retention. So this brings to mind, would it be maybe a good thing to encourage more businesses to Wirral? If that doesn't suit your ideology, I can see why the 140 million we're getting this year is very similar to 2018 when we had 140 million retained business rates. So if it doesn't suit your ideology, maybe you have to change your ideology, but at least the government has stepped in with 108 million capital investment to level up Birkenhead. So just in terms of the combined authority, we have the deputy mayor here, but she never seems to mention the combined authority. I noticed in the consultation document, somebody asked what's the point of the Metro Mayor. Well, if you want to look it up, there are um, the Chief Exec and six directors and the Monitoring Officer in the Combined Authority. Their combined salaries are £100 million. They've all got strategy in their title. Do you want all those strategic directors here as well? Or do you want to let this team get on with a difficult task they've got? Helen, please. Thank you. The formal consultations are now open. I would encourage you to take part. Please, thank you. Councillor Paul uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd just like to congratulate Councillor Campo and Gorman on their maiden speech. We hear criticism from members opposite about Labour mismanagement when in power. As Councillor Fouts has alluded to earlier, they forget that when the Lib Dems and the Tories were last in power here in Wirral, in the condemn loving, they were busy imposing austerity, sacking our staff. They left a multi-million pound overspend for the subsequent Labour administration having to balance the books whilst at the same time dealing with Tory austerity on the most vulnerable. Austerity that has continued to this day from this Tory government. The leader of the Tories opposite praises the government for levelling up. The only levelling up that most of our residents see here 
is happening in the bank balances of their Tory friends and donors. This Tory government is too busy indulging in party <laughs> scandals, cronyism, and Operation Say Big Dog, instead of dealing with the cost of living crisis, a crisis of their own making. While we have been dealing with the with de delivering food parcels and PPE to those who need it most, this Tory government have been delivering lucrative contracts for undeliverable goods to their mates, while people were following the rules this government was partying. While we are trying to help people with the cost of living crisis, the Tories are cutting local authority spending power, disproportionately impacting the poorest, most vulnerable members in our society. This year, we head towards tax hikes with soaring prices of essential items, inflation spiralling out of control, and the weekly food shop costs are going up. The Tories' failure to regulate energy markets, closing gas storage, presiding over slow progress on renewable energy and insulation homes is resulting in skyrocketing energy bills. The Tory government answer, hike up national insurance contribution for working people and businesses. Councillor Bird, with a blue Peter, here's what I prepared earlier display, only proposes amendments to a budget she doesn't agree with. She has not offered an alternative budget tonight. The decisions which form part of this budget have been, uh, this budget have been done with ever decreasing budget under the watchful eye of the government and the threat of intervention if we don't make these decisions. However, however any member all group vote here tonight. Every group has had their say. Every member has had an opportunity to contribute to the budget through their group, their group leadership, and individually through committees and budget workshops. Will council provide, what will council provides to residents will look and be delivered differently. However, from libraries to leisure centres, beaches to parks, green belt to brownfield, young and old, I want to reassure our residents that Labour have tried their very best to protect our residents and what they care about as best we can. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can just, I'm just going to ask now, we are getting very close to time now, and I've got a lot to go through on this, so is there anybody else who desperately wants to speak? Right, Cathy and Jill. And two? That's it then. Jerry. Sorry, Jerry. Do you have your hand up? Sorry, Jerry. Okay, mate. No problem. Uh, right, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Councillors Harry Gorman and Ivan Camp on their maiden speeches. And I want to make a small reference, uh, as Councillor Cleary and Councillor Gilchrist have, referencing the SIPPA report. It's the final paragraph, it's only a very short one, on section 5.2, Approach to Transformation Savings. And it says the optimism in the medium-term financial plan infers that the budget gap can easily and readily be closed. There is a risk that this will add to the perception amongst members that budgets can be balanced without recourse to any difficult decisions. And that's where we're at today in, um, in agreeing this budget. Mr. Mayor, in the last 12 months, Rural Council is only one of eight councils that have had to request exceptional financial support out of a total of 333 councils. Of those eight in the last 12 months, four are Labour, two are Conservative, one is Liberal and one is Independent. The External Assurance Review carried out provides a detailed assessment of the council's financial position and management, making recommendations where necessary for how the council can take action to improve. Even with the considerable financial support already provided, poor financial management has led us to this position. Labour would have us believe that it's all down to austerity, but I think the aforementioned fact speaks for itself. The Council must now ensure that it lives within its means, that budgetary controls are tightened and adhered to. In the past, the Council has avoided making difficult financial decisions and has used the general fund reserves to meet unexpected events which has led to general fund reserves depleting from 8% of revenue expenditure in March 2018 to an anticipated 3.3% by March 2022. Reserves must now be built back up to a minimum of 5% of net revenue expenditure going forward. I welcome the recent change from a cabinet to committee system 
allowing all members to be involved in the decision-making process of the Council, which is long overdue. In the past, under the Cabinet system, the Labour Administration made inappropriate and poor financial decisions behind closed doors, such as, as we heard, things like the Hoylet Golf Resort, The View magazine and the intention to set up a community bank. Like Nero, they fiddled while Rome burned. COVID has accelerated the pace at which sustainable transformation needs to take place and it requires cross-party cooperation, consensus and strong leadership. And so I hope we can all now work together for the common good of the residents of Wirral and I fully support this budget proposal. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And the last speaker, Jerry. It's a different one than the others, thank you. Right, uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Councillor Camper and their Gorm for their neighbour speeches. Uh, very well done and very impressive. Um, I've been a councillor for 24 years for almost all of that time, representing the wonderful people of Bevington. It's been an absolute honour. For 40 years, I've run around the Bevington Greenbelt, witnessing many problems during the most difficult times where the national planning system has allowed developers to run rings around planning officers and national inspectors. I've seen Councillor Pat Cleary from the Green Party vote for 20 detached houses, a car park for, as we've heard before, 120 vehicles and commercials in the, in the Green Belt and Eastern Conservation Area, and new, numerous vehicle, vehicle movements into the tiny road going into Eastern Village, wonderfully green. Uh, I think in Buckingham, Buckinghamshire, because of developers, the Conservatives lost the seat um, where developers took advantage of a weakened national planning system where only high-end houses were being built on Greenbelt land. In Bevington, I have seen hedgerows ripped out 120 years old and a retrospective planning application put in to cover it and we didn't have enough numbers of fauna and wildlife in the, in the hedge for action to take place. Wirral Labour Group has a policy of prioritising development on brownfield sites and no greenbelt development. Talking about golf courses, does the Green Party like them? Do they regard them as environmentally unfriendly? Brackenwood Golf Course is not only greenbelt, it is probably a key archaeological site in relation to the Battle of Brunegut there, which we know is, is the evidence is coming forward in the most magnificent way. To, uh, this, this is going to be one of the most important developments for the Wirral now in the last 10 years. Uh, the, site, the site at Brackenwood will continue to be a green belt jewel. I support Brackenwood Golf Course in their endeavours to bring in an asset transfer for Brackenwood Golf Course. Thank you. Right, we now move to the seconders of the motions, if they have not already spoken. So, um, first one is Councillor Walsh. You have now up to seven minutes to second the Green Group Amendment. Thank you, Mr Mayor. There is no doubt this is a serious time for the Council and for the people of the world. We are facing some difficult decisions due to years of mismanagement and over a decade of austerity, of austerity from a ruthless Conservative government. When I watched the Policy and Resources Committee the other week, I heard from impassioned residents who wanted their services saved, who wanted us to step up and make better decisions. We heard from people who were concerned for their libraries, their leisure centres, their golf clubs and more. I also heard a lot of councillors talk about their relief that this budget was no longer as bad as it was. I am not relieved. I'm deeply concerned. I'm disappointed at where we are today. This budget is a race to the bottom that other parties seem determined to win. We should be proud of our facilities and do more to become more entrepreneurial in order to make them a success. The Paradise Peninsula is being stripped of its assets, hitting the poorest community where it is 
whilst increasing the costs. At a time when our residents are being hit hard by the cost of living crisis, when people are choosing between heating and eating, we are only exacerbating this issue. Mr Mayor, this amendment talks about library provision. I do not want to see our libraries closed, let alone Rock Ferry or Greasby, but we do not wish to see these decisions made by two members who are both senior in their party, making sure that their libraries and their wards are safe and okay, at the sake of other libraries across the world. Just to confirm, by doing this, we're condemning High Bevington, Hoylake, Irby, New Ferry, Hensby, Prenton, Wallasey Village, Woodchurch and Bromber libraries to close. These decisions should not be made in a deal of policy and resources, the libraries with the greatest need should be saved. It should be about which councillor, it shouldn't be about which councillor sits, sits on which committee. It should be decided where the need is greatest. This budget also strips away our climate emergency budget to a pathetic amount. This winter has seen the devastation caused by increased climate chaos, floods across the borough, storm after storm after storm, which has brought down over 800 trees and forced people out of their home. This budget does not take that crisis seriously. Our amendment brings at least some of that money back to address the climate emergency crisis that will affect us all. There are further environmental punishments within the budget. Increased costs for re replacement recycling bins, increased charges for Eric Bulky waste collection, and increased allotment charges. These charges are likely to hit those with the least the most. We are likely to see increased fly tipping, reduced levels of recycling, and for those who grow their own or simply have an allotment because it gives them and their families access to their own green space, which they might not have in, the garden, in a garden at home, we are drastically increasing their charges. This amendment looks to ensure that our communities are better protected from antisocial behaviour and also protect services for children and further job losses. We are keen to pursue effective community asset transfer of many of our key assets as our hands will be forced to close them. But we must do this in a proper but efficient way. Do not let our assets become relics of their former glory, making them almost impossible to run again. Let's get this done properly, but let it be done in good time. For example, Woodchurch Leisure Centre, the Brackenwood Golf Course and our fantastic libraries. This budget is going to hurt our borough, hurt its people, and these amendments look to stem some of that pain and make it fairer and greener for all. I'm sure the people of Bevington did not elect me to support the Conservative government's regime of cut, cut, cut. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Kelly, you know, I'll open to seven minutes to second the Liberal Democrat Group's amendments. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll just start by congratulating Councillors Gorman, Camfer and Walsh on their uh, maiden speech. Um, two, two, two of them I, uh, I agreed with and one I didn't, but I'll, I'll come to that, uh, Mr Mayor. But Mr Mayor, this year's budget has been framed by the opinions and recommendations of national government inspectors. They tell us we have too many alleged facilities and we should be more like other councils, more often compared to Sefton with its similar population and demographic. We're told that Sefton has six libraries, whereas we have 24. Sefton has three swimming pools, we have six. Sefton has two golf courses, where we have four. And the inspectors ask, why can't you be more like Sefton? Mr Mayor, my party hates conformity. For women to become an identical council at the behest of government fills us with trepidation. The truth is we don't have funding which recognises the true cost of delivering statutory services. Instead, government forces up council tax to fill the gap. People actually want to see council tax spent on their local priorities like leisure and culture and not used as a subsidy to national taxation which leaves them paying for less of the non-statutory local services they value uh, and more council tax. So uh, we've heard from a number of Conservative speakers um, who have pointed to uh, what they regard as examples of waste. And I hope that Councillor Anderson will uh, agree that certainly this group's voting records so far as the golf resort, use of consultants, tackling fraud, these are issues that we can agree on, I'm sure, across the chamber we can also agree. But it's the sheer financial illiteracy that goes with the, um, with the claim 
that somehow it is wasteful to lend uh, surplus cash to other local councils, and somehow that it was wasteful to purchase assets at Central Bank and had as part of a regeneration initiative. So let that number of Conservatives have raised that. So let's deal with the facts. There was a Conservative before uh, had the goal to talk about facts to us. In terms of loans to other authorities, Council Anderson had 2018, I think, is the last year that that occurred, and that's true. But does he also know that we received income of close to half a million pounds on the back of that uh, of, of those loans? He doesn't tell us when he hits us with soundbites how he's going to bridge that half a million pound gap that if he didn't loan, uh, put out short-term loans, would be left in our budget. And let's also, let's also look at the Vue Cinema, shall we? Yes, we bought it. And, it's this, and it gives us, per year, a normal year, an 8% yield. Now, an 8% yield. Now, for those of us that have been sat at home in lockdown watching home, homes under the hammer, you will know that an 8% yield is something that gets them going, flipping that, that's good, isn't it? I wish I could have that. So how are you going to bridge that gap, Council Alex? So that's close to a million pounds per year that is already a hole in your budget and tackling a little bit of fraud at 45,000 and what were the other, um, uh, the golfers were. It doesn't come near, it doesn't come near, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Just briefly then to touch on uh, libraries. Um, Councillor uh, Baird uh, was honest enough to acknowledge that her amendment uh, would only give us a one year uh, respite and at the end of which we were back to square one. Probably worse because the structural deficit would not have been tackled and the level of the closures would have to be more. But Mr Baird, what is true, and Councillors Gorman and Walsh uh, were right uh, to call out uh, the vote on libraries of PR, where it appeared to those watching that Labour provided the pork and the Conservatives <laughs> provided the barrel. Um, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, it is going to be a painful exercise for many communities to lose the libraries that they've enjoyed for so many years. But what has to be paramount in our thought on this is that the process needs to be demonstrably fair and demonstrably transparent. And the antics of the front bench of the two largest parties parties have thrown that all into question and residents are right to consider it to be a disgrace. Mr Mayor, we have been approached by third parties asking about community asset transfer. I've seen interest expressed in Woodchurch, Brackenwood and some of the libraries. If asset transfer is the only way to save these facilities, we must listen, engage and help. Councillor Williamson refers to how the recommendation gives the Woodchurch Leisure Centre time and space. And I'd like to just, just pause to pay tribute to the work that Councillor Robinson, uh, although Councillor Robinson is doing, uh, to bring together interested parties on Woodchurch. Uh, she's working extremely hard and I've seen the benefits of that and I hope it comes to, uh, uh, to, fr to fruition. Uh, and I agree that it should be given that time. Um, but a realistic case, Mr Mayor, has been made for Black and Wood where the club is also working with external agencies equally hard. The leader talked about fairness in asset transfer, but she can't explain why the courtesy that's been extended to Woodchurch cannot also be extended to Brackenwood. Mr Mayor, I think the issue around the tennis centre also needs careful consideration. I've seen the Lawn Tennis Association offer to work with the council, and I do hope those discussions can yield some fresh thinking. It seems to me that a year-long year closure is unnecessary and the loss of the courts may well only serve to undermine the centre. That needs an awful lot more thought. Mr Mayor, I want to finish by uh, returning to the uh, issue of, uh, of Europa. I've moaned enough about it, so I want to say a few words in the time that I, I have and express my disappointment that the fun pool there is closing. This is, in reality, the only decent facility that we have for kids. I do understand it's old and there's a backlog of maintenance. It's also possible to claim that to attract businesses to occupy the office space in Birkenhead, a pool and a gym will probably be more of an attraction over a fun pool for school-age kids. A fun pool isn't something every council provides. The question is, should we have one here? If we want to promote New Brighton 
as a vis visitor destination for the wider region, maybe we should consider reproviding in that area. Uh, the uh, new facility is open in Seacombe. There's a, uh, another uh, area that we could uh, look for. Can you please come to a conclusion now? I, said, I do apologise. I certainly shall. Um, I, 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 do, I do think we should return to the issue of a front pool. But in conclusion then, uh, Mr Mayor, uh, we support the measures in the budget to give Woodchurch and the libraries the space they need. But let's also give the tennis centre and Brackenwood the time and space that they are asking for. This is what's missing, missing from the recommendation, a sense that people are being treated in an equitable and fair manner. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Nolan, you now have up to seven minutes to second the Policy and Resources Committee's proposals. Thank you, Mr Mayor. But can I first congratulate Councillors Gorman and Camper on their first speeches? And I would also like to pay my own respects to Alderman Hale. Um, I'm not sure that he would value my respect, however, he has them. Um, he and I had many, uh, a very fierce argument across the council chamber. And maybe I should start in the parallel universe that uh, Councillor Burgess Joyce was talking about because he is most definitely living in one if he believes that we can ignore austerity. And that, that is really, really foolish and definitely in a parallel universe. Austerity is there, we can't ignore it. It is an undoubted factor in not only this council asking, and I I'm, I'm not sure if the party opposite could work out whether it's 10 councils who've asked for financial support or eight. I'm not sure, but when you sort it out, if you could let us know, that would be good. All oh, right. Um, it's, it's eight or 10 so far, but there are many, many more who are on the bridge. Um, and they're not all Labour councils, as at least you admitted. However, we can't ignore it, but you made a big play on 265 million of COVID funding, which was great and extremely welcome. And as chair of the committee, um, most involved with that, um, it would be churlish of me not to welcome it. But when it's finished, it's gone. It's not long-term funding. It's not permanent support for this council. And yes, you've paid that out, and it's much appreciated. But you paid out, your government paid out billions, not to local authorities, but to support the biggest beneficiaries, which were friends of the Tory government on phony contracts that never delivered. We heard a lot of amendments tonight. Councillor Cleary, um, who tried to raise the question of green belt and the threat um, as not the only person. We're very clear that our party is committed and this council is committed to no building on green belt, no building on golf courses and that our development, as will be very, very clear, in the local plan is a brownfield first project. And that is the absolute commitment that was driven by our previous and current chair of regeneration committee. So we know that that is what will happen and that's what will be delivered despite scaremongering that's going on. We talk about everything has to be equal Everyone has to be treated equally. The residents of Rock Ferry are not in an equal position to every other part of this borough. They are one of the most deprived wards, not only in this borough, but in the whole of England. We demonstrated the need to keep that library in Rock Ferry open. There is nothing else in Rock Ferry. Rock Ferry doesn't have a leisure centre or a swimming pool or anything like that. Rock Ferry needs that library. It's essential. There are many, many people, A, 
who have no transport to get to other libraries, and B, who use that library because they don't have access to internet facilities, computers at home, and they use that library regularly for all those reasons. Young people who use it to do their homework because they're not living in conditions where it's possible to do their homework at home. So it's there, and the argument, it's not demonstrably fair, it's demonstrably meeting need, which is what this council is committed to do in the Will Plan. We are committed to dealing with the inequalities in this borough, which we know are vast. There are many proposals, I think, that we've heard tonight that we'd all love to agree with. Unfortunately, there would be inevitable consequences of government commissioners. And it's lovely to make all of these noises, but you can when you're a smaller party and you're never going to have to take the responsibility for making those decisions. Or when you're a lone voice um, and you have to take even less responsibility. It's easy to say, oh, let's ignore that threat. Let's not do what they say. We don't have to do as, as they tell us. I'm sorry, but for those of us who are going to take responsibility, we're not prepared to do that. We're not prepared to allow commissioners to come in and just ride roughshod over everything and just close and slash and burn everything in order to simply balance the books. We are trying to do what we can to protect as much as we can. And sorry, Councillor Cleary, but we have addressed the issue of the climate emergency. Um, maybe you didn't check the amendment, but we have addressed that issue as I think Councillor Gray has explained. Councillor Bird's somewhat confused um, amendment. Um, I'm still waiting for the no cuts budget that she told everyone that was possible, that she was going to produce. As recently as Saturday, I heard her telling people that a no cuts budget was possible. Sorry, it's not there, I haven't seen it. Where is it? You're going to tell us where it is, your no cuts budget, because the budget amendment that Councillor Birth proposed kicks the can down the road for a year on some of the cuts, only a million pound or so. The, the other 17 million are going to happen. So I'm still waiting to hear where this no cuts budget is. And by the way, just to correct um, one of your more misleading statements, um, Councillor Bird, the adults budget was not increased by five million pounds. It has been reduced by four million pounds this year. Perhaps you should check the figures. We have asked many, many questions about earmarked reserves. And I'm totally unaware, and I'm perfectly sure that our Director of Resources is totally unaware of where we've got to spare £20 million that can be used on frontline council services. She certainly, has, she certainly has not advised that that is the case. So I would suggest before any more misleading statements are made that the facts are checked. Misleading statements like the amount of money on Please, wages. No, I won't shut up. The average wage... Yvonne, this, I'm going to stop now. Like average wage in this council is around £30,000. And all officers are paid on nationally agreed rates. If you don't like it, take it up with the union. Thank you, Mr. Mellon. Right of reply. Councillor Baird, you now have five minutes to reply to the debate. Thanks very much and congratulations to the three councillors who've made their first speech tonight. The, the figures I quote are from the audited accounts for the council, so it's, you know, it's, it's all there in the public domain. You see the, the figures for health is on page 96 of the pack. You know, last year it was 113 million and this year it's 118 million, you know, it's a straightforward increase, net increase to adults. Um, the, the, I think a no-cost budget is possible. We have £330 million income this year. There's £29 million of usable reserves 
that could be repurposed. It's not been possible to, um, to get agreement of the Section 151 officer on um, various proposals, and maybe with time that could have come. Um, every couple of weeks there's more reserves that are released for, for various purposes and you know, reallocated. And it's possible that, you know, the committees could be looking at those areas as and when the specific proposals come to them in the, in the months to come. The, we've had, there's been a lot of blame game tonight, you know. <laughs> and I think in truth the answer is both. There's both austerity from the Conservatives government that's causing um, cuts to council services and there's also bad leadership on Labour's part. And we need to be looking um, at what we do about that and the proposals that are put before us today are legal, they create a balanced budget, they reduce some of the hardship of those cuts. The, and there's a kind of weird love-hate relationship going on between the Tories and the Labour Party in the Wirral Council in recent months, a strange unholy alliance. But when the chips are down, <laughs> when the chips are down, laugh if you like, but our residents are not laughing. This is a serious matter. Because when the chips are down, I am expecting Labour and Conservative to vote for cuts to frontline services. They're going to Let's be clear, they're going to vote to close our libraries when they don't have to. They're going to vote to close leisure centres when they don't have to. They're going to vote to close services that are hurting the communities we are elected to represent. The council has enough money to keep these services open. And if there is better leadership, I'm sure we could do that. Thank you. Councillor Cleary, you now have five minutes to reply to the debate. I've been asked to keep it short, Mr. Mayor, so <laughs> make sure I get my five minutes. Make sure I get my five minutes. Honestly, I thought we were bringing a refreshing candour to the to the council that uh, that needs to be welcomed. Anyway, congratulations to um, councillors Gorman, Camper, and Walsh on their maiden speeches. Right, a, a few points based on what people have had to say. Um, austerity, Mr. Mayor. I think um, Councillor Hodgson said we need to face the facts. And there seems to be alternative facts being bandied about. But if you look at the accounts from 2010, we had revenue of 330 million. The budget for next year presented to us tonight is 330 million. So it's exactly the same in cash terms. Adjusted for inflation, it's £85 million pounds less. That is the appropriate measure of the impact that austerity has had on this council. It's an £85 million pounds reduction. And that has real impacts. You know, Councillor McManus spoke very well about the, the inequality that we know all about, you know, but we don't hear enough of when we're talking about these cuts. You know, the food banks, the poverty, the, the rampant inequality in our borough that this budget will increase. Councillor Hodgson also referred to the, the community bank. I mean, Councillor Kelly went on about some of the, the things the Conservatives brought up that were just way, way off the mark. You know, five million pounds of the community bank. We're not spending five million pounds on a community bank because we're not allowed to. We've been told not to. It's this abusive relationship that Councillor Cook referred to, this lack of democracy, this, this centralised system we have in this country that doesn't give any uh, power to local authorities, real power to make real decisions. As Chair of Pensions Committee, I've been really lucky to attend um, parliamentary debates and discussions around a just transition to a low carbon economy. And I've heard the Pensions Minister, Guy Oppenheim, wax lyrical about the community bank that's been set up in his patch in Cambridgeshire. He said, it's fantastic, it's doing great things, it's investing in the local community, exactly what we want to see. Shall I have a chat with him? Have a chat with him, Andrew. You know, he'll, tell you, he'll, tell, he'll tell you how great a community bank can actually be. Having said that, we do have to acknowledge, as Councillor Bird said, there's two sides to the argument. And Councillor Nolan talked about taking responsibility. It would be nice to hear Labour just acknowledge some of the bad decisions that have been made in the past around children's services, around the Hoyle Court Resort, around the libraries, 
the annual subsidy for public car parking, a million quid every year, that is socially regressive and environmentally damaging. These are all decisions that have contributed to where we are today. Uh, Councillor Cox praised the committee system, and I, I agree with him. I think those kind of decisions I've just referred to are much less likely because we have much better scrutiny, we have much better involvement, and we're much less likely to make those, those bad decisions. But Councillor Brain made a good point as well about the lack of transparency around the finance subcommittee and the fact that most councillors don't really see what's going on, aren't involved and feel excluded. And that's something we have to address going forward. We can't go on like that with a small number of councillors uh, you know, making key decisions without the full involvement of all members of the council. And it, it was interesting to hear Councillor Cameron uh, say that some people were trying to undermine the committee system. Well, Councillor Cameron, you voted at PNR for the stitch up around Greasby and Rockbury Library. That, complete, that is the egregious example of undermining the committee system. Now, that is robbing Peter to pay Paul, making decisions based on who sits on what committee, uh, not actually taking the appropriate time and respect for all of the libraries across our borough to consider them appropriately. And as, as Councillor Gorman uh, said, you know, Greasby is one of the least uh, deprived areas uh, and, so, and, and probably one of the best for a community asset transfer. So you know, that, that is a stitch up that the public see through. And on climate, I, you know, I, I hear what Councillor Gray says, that she's heartfelt and sincere about the climate. But replacing revenue with capital for the climate emergency budget is not the same thing. You voted to slash the climate emergency budget. If you really care about it, you'll vote for our amendment that takes away this ridiculous ward member budget of £1,000 each. It's impossible to administer efficiently. The team that administers is, is being moved to another department. We don't even have the staff to administer it. If you really care about the climate emergency, vote for our amendment on your ward member budgets and give it to the climate and actually make a real commitment to addressing the abject collapse of our life support systems that is happening at alarming pace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Gukus, you've got five minutes now to apply to the debate. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think we've all agreed tonight that world has been forced into making a number of tough choices. We've heard about some of the past mistakes, and more choices will be made in the coming months. So when we look at these choices, there are three questions that I've got in mind. Are these fair? Do they cause damage? And can we look past the current crisis to a more stable future? We've got to create a pattern of libraries that will live on, that will survive. Communities that might run their own need a fair hearing. And each community needs time to put their case forward. So in the coming months, I hope there will be talks between the parties to try and work out a fair way of dealing with this. I had a look, Mr. Mayor, because the debate has lacked a number of facts. And I'll just deal with the simple ones. We did loan money to councils, but yes, we did make money on it. We never put a lot into the community bank because we weren't allowed to and the project was stopped at an early stage. We did buy the View Cinema at a time in the past and it was part of a redevelopment scheme. Unfortunately, the decline due to COVID meant that it has a different value now than had when it was bought, but it's a site that we own and might form part of redevelopment. Worldview was killed off in a good time, thank goodness. But a lot of things have been said by some Conservative members.